Failure is critical to success. This was a fight for my career, and I would just about sell my soul to the devil to beat this thing. I wouldn't, but damn close. How do you handle fear? I don't want the grieving to be over. I don't want to lose anything with my son. My dad was a, a tough dude. My dad's dead and I'm still afraid of him. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah. You have two things that you have control over. Number one, how you prepare and how you react to what happens to you. If it's a big dream, that means that you already love something. 95% of it's done. The head start is you got to get up early. You got three hours advance on your competition every day. Can you imagine what that's going to wind up with at the end of a year? Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Vibe with Humanity podcast, a show intended on spreading positivity by showcasing inspiring stories with real takeaways. I'm your host, Trevor. Today's guest is Steve Sachs. Steve is a retired Major League Baseball superstar with awards like Silver Slugger, Rookie of the Year. He was named All-Star five times. He's got two World Series championships under his belt. After baseball, he went on to become a financial advisor, extremely successful, a business executive and life coach. He's an author. He's a podcaster. He's a keynote speaker. His latest book, Shift, is all about cultivating and maintaining the mindset necessary to achieve things like he has. Personally, one thing I can tell you about Steve, he is the guy you see on camera, that positive, upbeat, humble guy who gives everyone the time of day. So Steve, with that, Welcome to Vibe with Humanity. I'm really excited to host you. And I'm excited to be here. I mean, Trevor, you're you're amazing at this. Oh, I can tell right you. now. You know, it's an aura that you have around people. And when you see them in action, you, you've got all the ingredients to be brilliant at this. So just keep keep pumping away and keep loving it. That's the main thing. Keep I, loving I it. I do love it. You're I do doing love it. awesome, man. Thank you. you. So I, we all know, you know. Steve, your career, we know you personally and stuff. I'm curious about your childhood. Like, What was your living environment like? How did you get along with your brother, Dave? What was your parenting style you were raised under? Like, You guys are tough mofos. <laughs> you're yeah. tough mentally. You're yeah. tough physically. Yeah. Not intimidated, not, yeah. not scarable. Like, mm -hmm. Did that come from your dad? Like, What was your household like? Tell me a little bit. Well, thanks, Trevor. We grew up on a farm in West Sacramento, and um, we grew up in a... Uh, kind of a strict Catholic household. And uh, my dad was a, a, a tough dude. Um, my dad's dead and I'm still afraid of him. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, okay. he was a tough dude, man. And he was old school and my mom was very, very loving. My, my father was German, my mom was Italian, so it made a real interesting mix around the household, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, they were great, great parents. Um, they both passed away from this earth way too young. My dad died at 47 of heart disease and my mom died at 58 uh, of basically the flu and we lost them way too soon but what they give us the enrichment they gave us through um, their knowledge and their love and support um, it and it was it was amazing it was a great blend of uh, caring discipline love and, and all that mixed in and you know we had a lot of personal responsibility and self-reliance growing up on on that farm we had to work together. We found out what teamwork was. Farmer strong, right? Correct. Because we had, you know, we had a self-sustaining farm as far as for our family went for our fruits and vegetables that we raised, cattle that we raised, some we slaughtered, some we had to sell at the auction. Um, so we made we made it work. My dad was a truck driver. My mom was a stay-at-home mother. And my when my dad had his heart heart attacks, he had five heart attacks before he passed away. He couldn't work any longer, so my mom had to go and get a job, and my dad stayed home. So we made it all work. So I've heard the phrase, obsession eats talent for breakfast. Yes. Now, yes. you mentioned it's necessary to have, and mm -hmm. I believe it is, especially mm -hmm. when you're going after big dreams. How do you think people can find an obsession? Or do you think it finds them? What does that process look like? I think it's a little probably a both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, talent's great. I mean, all the time. I hear people all the time, hey, my kid down the block throws 95. Yeah, everybody throws 95. You know, yeah. I mean, you find guys that fall out of trees to do that. Yeah. You know, and you go to spring training and you see coaches leaning up against the uh, batting cage and watching the new guy that they just drafted uh, a couple of years ago. And he's still in A ball. And they're thinking, why? You see, boy, he can throw. Look at him throw from the outfield. Then he runs the bases. Boy, he runs like a gazelle. Look at that speed. You know, Watch him hit the ball. Boy, he hits the ball a mile. This guy's got everything. And then they both look at each other and they said, can't play a lick. Really? Can't play a lick. 
What do you think the missing ingredient well, is? Well, there's two things. Okay. Two things missing. You have to have a dogged determination. That's the heart. You know, I'm, I'm not saying being cocky. The fire, but I'm saying the, the fire. Yeah. yeah. And then you have to have some, some, some stones, man. You got to be able and willing to be transparent and put it on the line. Whatever happens, happens. Because a lot of what happens is not in your control. You have two things that you have control over. Number one, how you prepare and how you react to what happens to you. The outcome, that's kind of, that's more of God's deal, mm -hmm. I think. But you have control of how you prepare and how you react. Explain Those the react part a little bit. Well, not everything goes perfect. You know, there's going to be... <laughs> yeah. Okay. We all know that, right? Yep. It happens to every one of us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I failed so many times in my life. Uh, it's I'm not afraid to talk about it, uh, you know, but lots of failures I've had. And I... I, which I think is absolutely critical to being successful. Failure is critical to success because you got to learn where that failure wall is and bounce off of that and learn the guidelines for that. It's like a kid that grows up with no discipline. I mean, they grow up very insecure because they don't know where the guidelines are. They're, they're lost. The same thing, I think, when somebody's striving for a goal. If you've never failed and you can't hit that failure wall, you're going to be pretty insecure about where's the guidelines here? How do I know where to push more? How do I know where to maybe pull back some? So I think failure is critical. Not that we're searching for it. It's going to find you. But you have to be ready to react to that and counter it. And, and you know, don't let it swallow you. How do you handle fear? Okay. Um, I talk a lot about fear and when I'm relating to people. And... You know, no, like a, hold that yeah. because it's raining and I have a spout here that's going to click if oh, I forgot okay. to put a rag in is it. it is it raining? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. One second. I'm so sorry. All right. Back. New shirt. Technical difficulties. Had <laughs> to fix a downspout. Got soaked. We're here. Steve, how do you handle fear? Uh, well, I had, a, I had a good dose of it when I was going through this throwing issue. I was scared to death. I thought I was going to lose my career. And so I... I, I I made a choice. I had to make a choice. I had to step over that line. I had to step in there. And I said, right now, for a while, this is going to be a huge fight. And I've got to get this right. And I'm going to make a commitment. So I made that commitment. I stepped over the line. I made the commitment. I said, right now, this is more important than anything. It's more important than my family. It's more important than anything. And I would just about, about this far, sell my soul to the devil to beat this thing. I wouldn't but damn close. This was a fight for my career. And it was more of a fight for my salvation as a person. It was more about that to me because I was embarrassed about not being able to throw a ball straight. And this was, it was more than just being a baseball player. So I, I made that commitment and, and I beat it. Is it okay if we talk a little possibly about the Johnny situation sure. surrounding the yeah. healing? I'm, sure. It's, you went through the worst imaginable thing a human can go through, the sudden loss or disappearance of a child. Mm -hmm. You are here, resilient. You're still full of light. Your faith is stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight you can share on your grieving and healing process that can help other people that are suffering through something? Yeah, that's... Uh, it's You never move on. You move forward, try to. Uh, and... Um, you know, Johnny was just uh, he's my loving son. Um, there's, it, and as much as you try to move on, your life's never going to be the same. Of course. It's a different world now. And I accept that. I know that God, that Johnny's with the Lord, and he's in a much better place than we are. I know all that. But it never does heal. You know, the pain's never going away until you take your last breath or your heart doesn't beat anymore. That's how, how it is. Uh, I was so close to my son. I knew him better than anybody. And, and uh, you know, I think about what his last seconds on the earth were like. And, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing. I have, his, I have his autopsy report. I have his, um, I have the, uh, the report of the crash site, all that. And I've never looked at it. I have it. I don't think I could either. I can't look at it. You know, I just, I just know that um, he's in a, he's in a great place, and uh, I will see him again, and I believe that.
I had a guy come up to me in the store one time, never, never saw him before, Trevor. And he came up to me and, uh, never knew this man came up to me. He put his hand on my shoulder and shook my hand and he didn't say anything. And he, he walked away, but he didn't have to say anything. He, uh, he said a lot without saying anything, really. I could see in his face. I wonder if he was going through the same thing. It sounds like it's not something that is ever going to be over. It's something no. you coexist with. So a lot of the tools yeah. that you're teaching in your book and your yeah. seminars are yeah. things that you're applying that yeah. obviously work and some of the worst things that can happen. Yeah, and I've talked to Johnny's mom about it too. And, um, you know, we we both kind of said the same thing. It's like, you know, the grieving and all that. And uh, I don't want it to be over. I don't want the grieving to be over, because I don't want I don't want to uh, to lose anything with my son. At least the grieving, I know I can feel him a lot. And it's almost uh, when you've gone through something like this, um, even though it's the worst thing that you can ever imagine. Um, in a sense, you know, it makes me feel like I feel close to my son still. You know. I love that you've been able to capture good from this with the foundation you created. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about yeah. that? Captain John J. Sachs Family Foundation is a, uh, you know, Johnny had such a passion for, for flying. And if he could come back, he'd be in the Osprey tomorrow. He loved it, and he was an expert at flying that. You know, the way he died, it was a double engine failure. And I uh, didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. In the report, double engine failure, and it's called a hard clutch engagement, where it reverberated from one engine over to the other, and shattered both of them. And he, they had no chance to recover the aircraft. It just fell like a rock out of the sky. And uh, from the last conversation with the uh, with a tower, they had 11 seconds before they hit the ground. And that's what haunts me, is those 11 seconds. It's like, I know he knew. I think he did. He's a very smart man. Um, but I also think that he was in work mode, and they have a protocol they go through when things like this happen. They train for it every day. And he was, you know, Johnny was a professional. He was a tremendous, tremendous professional. I had a question for you. You talk a lot about leadership and you're big on leadership. Yeah. Two parts. Can you explain what a leader is yeah. for you? Mm -hmm. um, and then do you think that can be trained into someone? A leader to me is somebody that does it by example. Action does it and doesn't have to talk about it. Okay. Th so that, that's leadership. That t second part question then, can it be trained? It sounds like if it's action-based, it absolutely can be trained. Yeah. You can build a structure like you're talking about. Absolutely. Stick to that structure. Absolutely. When you get success, people are going to want to follow in your footsteps. And, and the key there is they want to. Another thing with Steve Sack Speaks that's come up is you're you want to be comfortable having difficult conversations. I think that's something missing in American society. Mm -hmm. I just came from the corporate world. That was very hard for people to do was to have direct mm -hmm. straight talk as yeah. you would call it. One thing that I found challenging when I do that, cause I don't mind that, but my nerves can get away from me. And all of a sudden one wrong thing is said, I feel offended or something gets me and my fight or flight goes and now I've lost the ability to cognitively think. Mm -hmm. I just want to like rage on someone and yeah. I think later I should have said this, should have said that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any input on techniques or how to keep emotions calm during tough yeah. conversations? Yeah. In conversation, um, in interviews and in, in whatnot, stay on a plan. I think if you do that, that you kind of circumvent a lot of those Emotional yeah. things that can get you know that can get you riled up yeah. and whatnot, but I try to think about the ultimate outcome of what do I want to get from this, and um, I don't let those details or the emotional part of it. Um, I, I try to block that out from the beginning. Is that my plan is to not go there, not get emotional about it, and if I do, I'm gonna take a step back, take a breath, and go to the next stone, okay. go to the next stepping stone. That's what I try to do because I'm trying to wind up at a certain spot. So you. Pick a destination of where you want the conversation yep. to go. Mm -hmm. Practice ahead of time, repping it out a little bit, and maybe mm -hmm. anticipate things that could upset you. And then if they yeah. do, pause, take a breath, and then keep the destination in mind and resume the conversation. Exactly. Exactly.
For someone in their early 20s and they have a big goal, a big dream, inspiration hits them and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go pro at this or I'm going to build this into that, something larger than life. What's the first step? So the big, the first big step on, on, uh, on the dream is already accomplished because if it's a big dream, that means that you already love something. If you want and have a desire and a dream to do something, you love it. 95% of it's done. I've had questions all the time. People say, oh, I'm trying to get my son to, you know, I want him to be an architect, but he wants to do this stuff with financial stuff. And, blah, blah, blah. and I say, well, what does he love? What does he love to do? What should I get him to do? What does he love? He loves to do the financial stuff. And I said, well, let him explore that then. I believe in taking the reins off and let him go. Let him go. Let him uh. just... Let them run out. Let them fail. Please let them fail. A lot of times, parents want to be. They want to. They want to. Uh, they want to protect them so much. And I get it. It's all good intentioned. I'm in. I'm in favor of letting them fail. Let them fall down. Let them cut themselves. Let them bump their teeth. Hey, it's the best way. That's another thing I wanted to mention real quick. Is this head start. What's the head start is you got to get up early, okay? You can't you can't be sleep until ten o'clock. Pinch sleep or go to bed earlier to get up early. Oh, I'm saying I'm saying I go to bed early, but okay, you you know nobody has to. So pinch sleep if you have to. Because hey, get up early. You know what? If you get up at six o'clock, and the rest of your age group is getting up at nine, you got you got three hours advance on your competition every day. Can you imagine what that's going to wind up with at the end of a year? 365 days a year? You know, it's like a thousand hours yeah. you have an advance on your competition. I mean, it's amazing what that can do, that one little thing to get up, you know, relatively early, if you consider that. I mean, you got a huge advance on your competition. So I'm I'm a big advocate for that. You know, have a structure in your day and get up, get up a little early. Sleep until 10 or 11. I mean, ugh. I yeah, imagine that, that. <laughs> day's already gone. I I think I get the shakes if I woke up. It's ten o'clock. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd get. Oh my God, what's going on here? Yeah. I got to do stuff, man. Yep. Day's going by. So anyway, I think that's a that's an important thing too. Do you want to talk about your NFT? You want to tell a little bit about that? Sure. Okay. Really and, cool. And, and, and NFT is a non fungible token, mm-hmm. um, and uh, which means that it's absolutely immutable. It can't be changed, altered, or uh, added or subtracted in any way, and it's minted on the blockchain, so it's uh, it's impregnable. You can't you can't get into it and change it. Great, that's what an NFT does. I can't believe you just nailed that. Do you know how many times I've tried to teach myself <laughs> oh, really? one an NFT? I've yeah. asked people. That's getting yeah. uh, that that's going somewhere. Yeah, that just, that's what <laughs> continue. It is. Sorry. Not, okay, and it's called Babe and the Kids. That's the name of it. I love it. Yeah. Any so. available for the public? Yeah, we're holding fifty back for the public as well. So um, they can just go to babeandthekids.com babeinthekids.com. They're $15,000 each. And we are donating a big portion of the uh, profits because we're a for-profit company. We do other projects. But we're donating a big portion of our profits. As a matter of fact, 75% of all the money that's going to my son's foundation this year is going to come from the sale of this project. We're going to donate several hundred thousand dollars to my son's foundation from this. And a real quick blurb on your son's foundation. Yeah, it's called the Captain John J. Sachs Foundation. People can go to it by just going to johnnyourhero.org, johnnyourhero.org. And the foundation is about um, helping other aviators realize and capture their dreams like my son did. He wanted to become an aviator. So whether it's somebody that's trying to get through college that wants to be an officer in the Marine Corps or like John did, or you know they have uh, you know a... Uh, a hardship in the family, maybe whatever it may be, we're going to help them accomplish the dream of being an aviator. So it's a great cause. You have a lot going on. You have a lot to offer. I'm glad you got it in a book. I'm sure you've got speaking's book, the Steve Sachs speaks.com. Check yeah. that out. Give, if you give wanna... me about 20 more speeches this year, Trevor. I'd love, there you go. <laughs> I'd love there you it. Go. <laughs> yeah. Well, get them out here guys. Cause I don't know if it came through in the camera. I'm pretty sure it did, but there's just a, a vibe coming off this guy and energy. There you go. Vibe with humanity. That's it. All right. Thanks for having me, Thank you for joining. Yep. Thank you.